All right, great. Uh, well, thanks so much. Uh, we're, we're excited to have you all here for week three of the Better Plants uh, online learning series. So um, as, uh, as the slide indicates, this one should be a really interesting one covering uh, lighting, HVAC, and building envelope. Um, thank you to all of you who've been able to join the ones in the past as well. It's been a, a really great turnout and something that uh, we, we've really enjoyed. Uh, hopefully it's bringing us together a just a little bit uh, through these uh, crazy times. So next slide which is a picture of me, I believe. We can move quickly over that. It's nice to, <laughs> nice to have everyone with us here today. Um, as I mentioned, this is week three. Um, the next week one that I'm, I'm pretty excited about as well is uh, it's called Resources You Should Know. So we're gonna bring in some of our cousins in the federal family, the, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture Rural Development Program, and then the Department of Commerce Manufacturing Extension Partnership Center. So these are the MEP centers are located in all 50 states and are really just a great resource for, uh, for manufacturers that you, you should be taking advantage of. So uh, please join us. That will be back to our regular time of Thursday at 1 p.m. And then after that, we'll return to our uh, technical trainings on compressed air systems and water efficiency. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, in case you've missed it, if you weren't able to join either of the previous ones, uh, the recordings are online. They've been transcribed for, uh, for compliance with posting them online. Uh, please go back and watch them. I know I'm uh, guilty of this for those of us, you know, juggling all sorts of responsibilities and childcare responsibilities and everything else. Oftentimes I will sign up for webinars and then uh, go back and uh, uh, go back and watch the recordings later. So our, our turnout has actually been uh, remarkably high. It's been in great to see, but for those of you who might have missed the previous ones or learned about this later, please uh, please go back and uh, watch or, or uh, listen to the previous webinars. Next slide. And then a continued reminder, uh, we're really excited for the uh, virtual 2020 summit. We had a meeting on it today. I think it should be a really exciting a uh, couple of days with uh, plenary speakers and recognition and a uh, couple, you know, identifying the panels that are, are most easily adaptable and uh, uh, best for the, uh, for the virtual summit. So we'll have our better practice and better project awardees, hopefully presenting their, uh, uh, what made them get the, the recognition this year and uh, showcasing some of the coolest stuff that we've seen from our partners this past year, um, as well as uh, the Pecha Kucha session, which is really challenging our partners to think about how they're talking and presenting about what they've done in an interesting way. Um, so uh, reminder on that. Uh, thank you. Next slide. And with that, I, uh, I'm excited to turn this over to, uh, to my colleague, Tom Wenning. Um, before I do, just uh, uh, we'll have our contact information at the end. Um, please send us feedback. Let us know your responses to these. Let us know uh, what we could be doing differently. Um, we're about halfway through the first six weeks that we planned. Um, I'm really enjoying these and the response has been pretty good. So uh, there's, uh, there's interest on our end in continuing this beyond the first six weeks. But if there are particular topics you'd like to see covered, or if you want us to move back to having partner share like we did with Al and the, Al Hildreth in the first uh, panel, if there's other ways that we can do this, we're, we're very open to your feedback. Please let us know. We, we want to make this, uh, we want to make this so you get the most out of it. So with that, I will, Turn this over to uh, to Tom. Tom, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Eli. So I I really quickly just want to echo Eli and what he was saying there. You know, we realize all of you are spending your time here today with us, and, and like we really do appreciate it. But we want to make sure that your time is well spent. So uh, as Eli mentioned, we had the first six weeks mapped out here. But if there are other topics. Uh, other other items, or if you want to just hear from success stories of other partners, right? Let us know. We we really do take your feedback pretty seriously here. Okay, so uh, transitioning uh, into today's topic, uh, we are going to be chatting a little bit about lighting, HVAC, and building envelope. Okay, so these systems are ubiquitous. They're everywhere, right? They're not necessarily the biggest hitters for uh, some of our manufacturing sites, you know, they don't use necessarily the most energy, but they're extremely important nonetheless. You know, uh, everywhere I go, a lot of people I talk to, you know, they're still talking about low hanging fruit. And when they say low hanging fruit, while that term itself makes me cringe, the the reality is a lot of times they're referring to lighting, 
in switching out lighting. So we, we still know these opportunities exist. These things are important. So we're going to be stepping into that today. And I, I will caveat a lot of the discussion around today's uh, lighting, HVAC, and building envelope. They're going to be a little bit more manufacturing industry oriented. Okay. So we're not necessarily going to be talking about, uh, let's say, HVAC strategies for uh, residential and commercial buildings, right? I'm not touching on that. If you want to hear about that, let us know, <laughs> okay? Um, and I, I guess on, on that front, the letting us know part, uh, for most of you, there should be a chat box or something similar uh, as part of that go-to webinar or software. Use that, please, okay? So as, as I'm going through the presentation today, as we're stepping through the different things, Submit your questions uh, at the end. We'll we'll wrap up with some Q and A, um, and go from there. So I think uh, Marissa, uh, I think we can switch things and get started. Our class outline today: so lighting, HVAC. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the different types of equipment in each one of these, and then we'll get to the building envelope stuff. So uh, we'll jump into lighting first. So lighting. Uh, pretty simple, but there's a couple high level terms that we just need to be conversant in. So similar to last week where we were talking, you know, BTUs and watts and things like that, uh, there's some similar lingo in the lighting world that we just need to be aware of. Uh, so the first and kind of foremost, when, when we go and buy lights, uh, most of the time they're, they're rated in wattage, okay? And the watts is really what's being drawn in by the lamp. Uh, or the fixture, so that's our that's our power input. Okay, so watts, power input. The and then as that electricity is going through, the electricity is converted into light, and and that light leaves the the lamp, and then we start talking about it in terms of lumens. Okay, and so the lumens are really what's leaving the lamp and and heading heading off to uh, you know brighten our day of sorts. Okay. And so that's another one of these components that uh, lights will typically be sold by. You know, it's the wattage, which is, you know, the energy consumed, and then there's the lumens. And from there, it, it, it goes in a number of different directions. Uh, but, but sticking to kind of the power, the efficiency aspect of things, uh, you know, if we combine those two, the, the output over the input, then we're, we're, we're starting to get into this uh, lighting levels, okay? The two most common ones that we talk about our foot candles and or lux they're they're essentially it's it's the same terminology it's just they're different units it's either lumens per square foot so that's a, a fairly common thing here in the u.s we talk we talk foot candles uh but if you're maybe across the pond it's lumens per square meter okay uh, there's obviously conversion since it's it's just a, a matter of area and if, if you're super interested uh, you know, you can see the conversion factor, the one foot candle to 10.8 uh, lux. So now, now you should be conversant on, on that front. Uh, from there is where we get into efficacy. Efficacy is, is just the, think of it kind of like efficiency is what it boils down to. It's the light output versus the power input, right? Uh, so that's the efficacy of our lights. And we're, we're going to step into a couple different types of lights and you'll see that this this efficacy or or in a different way of thinking about it, it's kind of an efficiency rating of it changes from from lamp to lamp um and so if we if we use the loom if we use the words that we were uh, just talking about that lighting output per our per power input is simply our lumens per watt okay so that's this lpw and we're going to use that uh, acronym a couple times later on now with that said those are those are like the big ticket items that we typically look at when we're purchasing and, and looking for installing lights in our facility. But there's a number of other criteria uh, that are also associated with lights. The Probably the biggest one or the, the next most important one is the CRI. It's this color rendering index, okay? And essentially what, what that is, it's the ability for us to uh, be able to tell different types of colors based on the light. And I think we'll, we'll step into this here in a, in a couple slides, that CRI and how, how that's important, okay? So from a lighting standpoint, 
uh, a lot of these are, are fairly simple to understand. And in some cases, you've already seen them all around you throughout life. Uh, the basic one that goes back all the way to the Thomas Edison days is our, our basic incandescent. Uh, then we have the compact fluorescence, which, you know, in, in our homes, you know, that's the little swirly twirly uh, light bulbs, right? Uh, in industrial settings or, or maybe in your garage at home, you might have the linear fluorescence and that's these big tubes, right? Typically they're, they're four feet long uh, in, in, in old time, older times, they used to have eight feet long ones, you know? Um, and, then, and then it gets a little bit more exotic where we're typically only seeing some of these next ones in uh, either industrial settings or, or outside in that uh, this is our high intensity discharge uh, light lamps. So mercury vapor, there's metal halide, and then the high pressure sodium. And, and then last but not least, and, and these are ubiquitous, is the LED light bulbs. And let's step into some of the characteristics of a lot of these here. Okay, so incandescent. This is, this is the standard light bulb that we have at home, uh, or used to have at home, I should say, uh, because these, for the most part, have been legislated out, uh, and the rules are changing all over the globe and, and some countries are much further ahead uh, than others but this is this is the the old thomas edison light bulb right there's a little filament in there it gets really hot it glows uh, the efficacy is not great but these things are super cheap and uh, that's why they, they really st stuck around for so long uh, but you'll notice out of all the lighting examples the efficacy so the, the efficiency of of the light is on the poorer side okay and the life is on the lower side but it's always been kind of the lowest cost item so that's why most of us have went with them uh but that's not an, you know that's not the efficient way to go so that's incandescent i think we can all wrap our heads around that the this next category is uh really our fluorescence okay so at home there's the little spiral guys right and that's what we have to the right here these are pretty, they were pretty common uh, for a number of years when people were originally moving from incandescent over to uh, fluorescence, okay? The one that has been around in the manufacturing world for quite some time in the, the commercial sector for a really long time are our linear uh, fluorescence. And so for the most part, these are four feet long. They're uh, just long tube lamps that uh, typically, as you're walking around, you might have them, again, in, in hallways, you might have them out in the manufacturing space, but there uh, will typically be a fixture with, say, two, four, maybe six, depending on, on the arrangement, and if you ever look really closely at them, there's a couple different sizes of these guys, and typically they're sold in either like a T5, a T8, or if you, are, if you have a really old facility, you might have T12s, okay? And what the what those numbers mean? Those numbers are just a proxy for the diameter of that. Okay. Right so, T5s. If you're looking at these things, T5s are are the thinnest. Uh, they're they're actually uh, rated in kind of one eighth inch increments. So uh, the T5 is five eighths of an inch wide in diameter. Uh, T8 eight over eight. That's one inch. And then T12. It's going to be larger than that. T12s are, for the most part, you don't see those too often anymore. They're being phased out, uh, or people are replacing and upgrading, or have upgraded already to the T8s long ago. Uh, T5 and T8, there's some uh, differences in between the two in, in situations where you might want to use one versus the other, but uh, these are super common uh, and have been for a pretty long time. The efficacy is a lot better, okay, so that lumen per watt is much better than our incandescence in the life it can be quite a bit better. All right. So the next level here is stuff that we typically only see in uh, industrial settings or let's say outside. Uh, a lot of outdoor lighting has historically been one of these three. Uh, or maybe in, in our schools and like a gymnasium, these things have been popular for a long time. So there's three main types on this front. There's mercury vapor, there's metal halide, and then the high pressure sodium. Uh, the, the, the difference here uh, with all of these is 
well, well, there's a lot of differences, <laughs> I should say. The ones that are most common uh, are probably the metal halides as well as the high pressure sodium. And these are really easy to spot for the most part. The metal halides, if you ever remember growing up and, and playing, uh, you know, maybe basketball in a gym or, or, you know, maybe riding your bike outside at night and, you know, a light goes off, you can't flip these lights back on. These metal halides, all of a sudden it, it's this warm, uh, warm up period, this restart period where it takes sometimes 15, sometimes it's even longer than that, 20 minutes for these things to fully come back on. So uh, I, I remember growing up and playing basketball, the lights go out because there's a little blip in the power and then you're there 20 minutes later waiting for the game to restart, right? Uh, so these are these are still common in industry. They're, they're just not very efficient, okay? Uh, and then the high pressure sodium, these are, these are typically still found outdoors. These are the ones that throws off a really yellow, yellow light, kind of an orangey yellow type of a, it's kind of a Freddy Krueger dingy type of a light. These high pressure sodiums put out a ton of light. It's just not really good quality light. So, you know, if you, if you stand under one of those and you're trying to look at a nice red apple, that apple's not gonna look very red, right? Whereas if you might be under metal halide, it'll, it'll be popping some colors there. Uh, the problem with all of these though are still, they're just not that efficient. You still see these things, but there is a major trend and there has been for, for a really long time now to upgrade all of these. And that brings us to the, the current LED, uh, this light emitting diode. Uh, by and away, it has kind of all of the characteristics we want out of light. It has a pretty good efficacy. So again, that's our efficiency. Uh, has a really long life uh, in comparison to all of the other types of lights that are out there. Uh, they can have a great CRI, this color rendering index. It's a fairly mature technology now. These things have been on the market for quite some time. Uh, there's a, a whole number of different form factors, whether it's bulbs, it's tubes, it's the, the HID replacements, there, there's a whole slew of different uh, form factors for it. For the most part, they're fairly plug and play. In some systems, you can actually just pull out the old tube or the old light uh, and, and put in the new one. Uh, use some caution there uh, to make sure that there's compatibility, but in some cases there are. More and more, uh, these things have a great return on investment. So these uh, are really the way to go if you're looking at your lights, um, not only in your facility, at your home, you know, kind of everywhere you're at, chances are there are LEDs. They're, they are a slightly larger upfront cost, but in the long run, uh, they will pay back in about every, every form and fashion. So here's just a really high level uh, overview of all the lighting uh, comparison points. So you can have access to this later and, and you can kind of scan through things, but the LEDs, which are uh, highlighted in that green column there, you can see that they're essentially the most efficient. Uh, so this efficacy in the in the was at the fifth row down. Uh, they, they, for the most part, put out the most light or can put out the most light for the least amount of uh, electrical input. They have uh, great CRIs for the most part across the board. Uh, they have low maintenance lives. They have really long lives, uh, which is important. You know, the longer it is, the the longer it lasts up in this in the fixture, the fewer times we need to call the maintenance guy to come out, get a lift, get a ladder, get you know to get up there and replace it. So that's a, a major selling point um, as well. And then uh, there there's some other aspects of uh, having contamination. So some of these old ones have mercury in them. So you have to be really careful when you dispose of those things. So um, just a I'm not trying to sell LEDs, but that's where you ought to be thinking. Okay. So a couple <clears throat> other items as far as lights. So one that most people don't really um, know about, or it's not super obvious, is that all of these lights degrade over time. And here's, uh, here's the common uh, types of lights that we look at. So there's LED, there's fluorescent in the yellow. And then we have the high pressure sodium and the metal halides. And what you can see when you buy it, when you buy these light bulbs, you know, they start off 
at the at the essentially the rated amount you know what's the the lumen outputs that it was sold at the problem is fairly quickly within the first year some of these lights dramatically start tailing off in terms of what it can put out okay and so even if you were to even if you had say let's say this metal halide which you know the lowest rated life here you know even if you just replace some of those lights from time to time with a newer light all of a sudden it's like wow i can see a whole lot better because you might be jumping from let's say a 50 percent lighting output and you go back up to 100 percent output um so this is something to just keep in mind you know you might relamp a whole facility right but over time the the lighting quality is going to degrade for your whole facility okay and so that plays into you know maybe how many lights you put on install at first or you know how often you might need to replace lights things like that uh, but one of the i think one of the real clear takeaways with this is that leds are by far kind of the best option you know not only are we looking at 50,000 plus hours you know that's that's more than five years of continuous you know 24 7 365 type of operation uh, and it maintains its lighting level much better than most of the others okay and so uh, you know this is this is really important that's a that's a really critical factor to consider here all right so another item that we had talked about earlier is this color rendering index and this is important especially if you're doing detailed task work or uh, let's say you're trying to match colors uh, you know that color rendering is what allows us to see uh, essentially the true color okay so uh, if you're outside outside you know daylight is the best light uh, by and away so it would have a CRI of 100, right? And, you know, any anytime we try to mimic uh, the sun, the sunlight, right, to be able to see, you know, what what our strawberries might really look like, you know, our, our baseline is going outside in, in that natural lighting. And from there, you know, it, it just kind of tails off. So we have incandescent and halogens uh, really at the top end, which is one of the beauties of those uh, older technologies. But from there, we have our fluorescence, our metal halides, and you can see things just seem to tail off, okay? Uh, with the high pressure sodium, it's, it's, it, these, are, these are those yellow lights, right? Uh, imagine standing under the yellow security light, maybe outside of your building or out in the parking lot, and you know, trying to tell the color difference between an apple and, a, and an orange. It's really tough, okay? Uh, LEDs aren't on here, but LEDs are, for the most part, up here on the top end, uh, you know, at typically 100, somewhere 90 to 100 in terms of CRI, okay? All right, so now that we've talked about a couple of the basics, uh, a couple of things to consider in terms of lighting and, and really how we uh, best light our facilities. So the first step, really, in, in terms of looking at our light uh, is that we don't want to underlight or overlight the area. You know, not enough light, then we're straining our eyes and we're making people fairly uncomfortable and it, it kind of wears us down, it, it drags us down. But on the other side, if we have too much light, then that also really kind of affects us. And uh, both of these items, you know, not only is it on a comfort level, but it's on a productivity level. And uh, there are some studies out there that have some pretty remarkable uh, effects or, or outcomes from having the right levels of lighting and the right type of lighting. And uh, so it's a really important aspect to pay attention to. Uh, obviously, on, on over lighting, we're, we're wasting energy. So even more so, we're, we're paying extra dollars out of our pocket to someone else when well, we ought not be doing that. So with all of these, you're like, okay, so I don't underlight, I don't overlight. How do I know if I'm doing either one of those? Uh, well, there's a number of resources that are that are available. Over here on the right-hand side of the screen, is, this is just an example of recommended lighting levels for different spaces, for different applications, okay? So here towards the bottom, we have our industrial interiors. 
And there's a couple recommendations in terms of what we should be doing, okay? Uh, and this is all based on foot candles. So that term we had talked about earlier, uh, this, is, this is how we measure our lighting, okay? We just measure the, the foot candles in an area, and then we just wanna make sure that we're providing enough lumens per square feet, essentially, to meet these different types of uh, lighting levels. And I think we go into a little bit more uh, detail here on this page in the next one. So by and large, a lot of people in the lighting world, they all point back to this IES uh, organization, the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. This, this, these are the, really the standards, folks. Uh, not necessarily standards, but they have the best information. They spend a lot of time uh, doing the studies and setting some of the criteria and guidelines for happy, happy productive employees and, and persons. So there's a number of different criteria that they, they base their lighting requirements off of. There's technically 13, I guess, uh, which ranges based on the type of tasks that are being performed, the, maybe the size of objects that you're trying to handle, as well as uh, even the level of detail of work and even the age of workers uh, that are in that space. So uh, a, a couple obvious points, you know, if you're working with really small items, right? Maybe you have small screws, you know, you need a little bit more light to see what you're doing there versus working with a, let's say a giant part, you know, a big chunk of metal, right? Uh, and similarly in, in areas where you need more contrast, you need more light. So if, if you're dealing with parts, let's say they're both the exact same color and they're silver and you're, you're trying to, I don't know, align, some some things there obviously you need some more light and then uh, the last things on here this adjusting for the age of the worker this is to me it's kind of funny uh because i was looking at one of the studies yesterday in that you're as, as you all know we we all age we all start to break down a little bit uh and well our our eyes have one of these uh one of these issues where we start to lose some of our vision of sorts. And over time, our eyes are not able to pick up the brightness of things. And so, you know, there are, um, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the exact numbers here, but it was, you know, if you're 20 years old, you can be doing a task at say, let's say 30 foot candles. That's kind of our standard, uh, you know, lighting that you would have in your office. If you age 30 years, if you turn 50, you need over double the amount of foot candles to essentially have the same uh, level of light, the same vision acuity that you had when you were 20. So there, there is a, an adjustment factor for when you were older. Okay. So it, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. So going a little bit deeper into these lighting level recommendations, uh, we pulled out just a couple examples here. Uh, so these are high level examples on this front, but ordinary tasks, say in your office or manufacturing world, you might be somewhere on the 50 foot, can foot candle level. Uh, that might be pretty standard. If you're, let's say in a storage room picking, picking parts, and let's say they're just normal size parts, maybe the size of a baseball, right? You can get by with 30 foot candles. If you're just picking large boxes, right? You might need a lot less than that, okay? It could be, uh, you know, 10 to 20 foot candles. Uh, whereas if you're picking really precise parts, maybe it's much more than that. Uh, loading, unloading. So maybe in our docks, we're looking maybe at 20 foot candles. And then, and then there's this really, what I would consider a judgment call in terms of the difficulty of task, but it, it starts at a hundred foot candles and goes all the way up until a thousand foot candles. So that's really depending on the specific task that you are working on manufacturing wise. You know, if you're maybe soldering really tiny wires, right? You need a lot more light for that. But these are some of the, the standard criteria that you would find out there, okay? So with that said, there's still uh, quite a few lighting opportunities. There's saving opportunities for helping us to save money, but really to save energy and then uh, that saves us money at the end of the day. So the, the big one uh, that, that most of us are typically most attuned to are, well, let's just change the lights. Well, yeah, that, that, that would work uh, for the most part. And that is, a, that is a big one. So switching to LEDs, you know, I wasn't trying to sell them earlier, but uh, based on some of the information I was showing you there, LEDs are 
just really a kind of a clear front winner at this point in time uh, with some pretty massive savings over some of the previous technologies, okay? So once you, or if you do that, you know, there are still a number of other uh, approaches that maybe are not too capital intensive, but very much on the behavior side that can save us a lot of energy. And that gets into this, this occupancy sensors, the avoiding overlighting, and then even using task lighting. So using spot lighting. So the occupancy sensors, uh, you know, if you have really well-trained uh, individuals in your workplace, you might be able to get away with switches and the last person leaves, turns them off. If it's anything like my children and in my house, for some reason, those things are, this is like they're haunted by the boogeyman. No one touches them. So that's where we might look at timers as a, a simple alternative to making sure our lights are on a schedule going on and off. But more advanced approaches really are photo cells. So that's for uh, helping to account for natural lighting that you might be having in a space or occupancy sensors. And there's a number of different types of occupancy sensors that uh, can turn lights on and off uh, for us. And this really just helps us to be able to provide just the right level of lighting when you need that lighting. Because let's face it, if you're in a, a stock room and you know, Jim, the stock man goes in there once a day, you don't need that whole stock room lit 24 seven, you just need it when he's in there. And so uh, being able to effectively control the technology, probably in a lot of cases, has an even bigger impact than just changing out the type of technology, the type of lighting that we're doing. Um, there's also op opportunities with the occupancy sensors to, you know, dim areas, uh, you know, this area with less traffic. Uh, we've definitely seen, uh, you know, in a storage facility, you might have an occupancy sensor on each row. And so as you go to that row, the whole row kicks on. And then as you leave, it, it all kicks off. Uh, you actually might see this if you go to your local grocery store. There's more and more that are doing this within their refrigerator sections. So their their freezers, their upright freezers. You know, as you get close to the the aisle way, the the lights kick on, right? And then as there's no one in there, they turn off. Same same concept uh, in theory there. So on this other one though, this avoiding lighting, a lot of opportunities here. Um, and really, there, there's kind of ongoing opportunities in some cases to make sure that you're just providing the right level. And I would say these last two, this avoiding overlighting and using spotlighting, are somewhat inter, intertwined in that you want to provide a base level of, of lighting everywhere from kind of a safety perspective. But more so, you know, can you just put the lighting right where you need it? Okay, so, uh, you know, that's this task lighting, the spotlighting. You know, if you only need it, if you only need highlight on your workbench, well, just provide the workbench with a lot of light, not the entire space, okay? Uh, and so avoiding just overlighting everything. And I think this is actually one of the unique areas of this, this um, LED retrofits, if, if you all have ever seen this, is that uh, initially, a lot of LEDs, you can, you can tune them or you can uh, dim them to some level and so manufacturers may initially request a space to be overlit in terms of the design but then as the bulb uh, or bulbs start to degrade over time you just ramp that, uh, that that power form back up so that way you can have a consistent light over a really long period of time so you never have that true degradation uh, which is a, a really unique functionality of LEDs that uh, some of the others don't necessarily have. But it's all about providing the right level of light to your, um, to yourself, to your employees, and to the others in your space. So that's all the traditional lighting approach. Uh, one of the outside the box approaches that uh, used to be extremely common you know, very early on in, in uh, civilization and uh, really all the way into the 20s, 30s, and 40s is this idea of utilizing daylight. Uh, and so there is a, a little bit of a, a push where this stuff is coming back uh, to an extent because, because of all the studies, because of kind of the health benefits of being exposed to natural light, 
you do start to see more daylighting options being put in. And really there are three main ones that, that you'll see. There's this advanced polycarbonate wall. So this is, this is like a really like a corrugated paneling that you'll typically see uh, maybe on a side of a building. Uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll put it up near the ceiling. Uh, so you let in a little bit of light and it's pretty diffuse. So it's not super bright light uh, like a window might let through, but it provides a general lighting uh, in a lot of cases for kind of safety aspects. Uh, which is really popular and is really making a big comeback. There's the obvious skylights, which are uh, just kind of the, the big square holes in the ceiling that you know you have a, a covering on. And these are really common if you go to some big box stores. Uh, and then the last one is this daylighting tube, which is a little bit more unique for say office settings, but uh, it's all about trying to bring in some of the natural light uh, one to save energy, but two, there there are some really major productivity benefits. There are health benefits, uh, a lot of other aspects that uh, should be considered. But daylight is um, definitely a big opportunity uh, to the point where this this picture here on the right, this is a, a manufacturing line where they're making tractors. There's there's obviously no tractors on the line right now, but there's not a single light on in this facility right now. Uh, they have you know a full wall of lights uh, as well as some of the, the lights up at the very top that is just bringing in nothing but natural light. So uh, really there are big potentials in, in you know, going back to those approaches. All right, so that's lighting. We're gonna move on uh, to our HVAC systems here, okay? So HVAC is just our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, uh, which at the end of the day, we're, we're just trying to provide uh, the right environment for our people and equipment. And, and that takes the form of uh, a number of different things to control temperature, control humidity, uh, move air around and control that indoor air quality, okay? So uh, a couple things at a really high level, uh, most of us uh, like to work in a, in a pretty narrow range. Uh, and some of these are, are specified by a couple organizations that are out there, but our, our standard range that most of us are comfortable in is that 68 to 76 uh, degree range uh, with a humidity of 40 to roughly 70%. Uh, you know, there are some uh, expansions on either end, but that's kind of a rough, comfortable range for most of us. And then as far as the indoor air quality, this is a, this is a pretty big, uh, factor in, in ASHRAE 62.1 actually provides some standards for indoor air quality as well as ventilation for, for really healthy, uh, really healthy people. Uh, I was going to say healthy and productive, but uh, I think health is the, the first and foremost of that one. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, if you get a little bit deeper, uh, what we're looking at right now, it, it's super busy. This is called a psychrometric chart, which it tells us a lot of things about air, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time, but what I really wanna point out here is that there's this comfort zone right in the middle, okay? And this is key because if, as, as long as our conditions are anywhere in there, for the most part, we feel pretty comfortable. Uh, there are strategies to move outside of that. And I, let me, I guess, point out a couple things with the psychometric chart, if this is the first time you've seen one. On the bottom axis is just our, our temperature. This is the temperature that we might have from, a, from our thermometer, okay? So, so having uh, the right temperature range in there, you know, that we can be comfortable. With. And then the second piece, and that's where these uh, swooping lines come in at over here, this is a relative humidity lines, okay? So on the bottom end, they actually are showing 20% uh, 20, 20 relative humidity, whereas on the top end, in this case, they're showing 80%. For the most part, if you can provide people with this this level, you're they're going to be pretty comfortable. Uh, you can go outside of that based on different strategies, which is what's plastered all over <laughs> this uh, psychometric chart. But there's a lot of wiggle room in here that we can provide comfort to our employees. Okay, so how do we provide uh, that comfort for folks? There's a number of major HVAC equipment that we'll run into, okay? Uh, the biggest or one of the most common uh, are chillers, 
okay? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a couple of weeks. Uh, chillers essentially are creating chilled water. They're, they're cooling water for us, and then we're using that cooled water to then uh, cool the space, cool people, cool products perhaps. Uh, another, another technology that's really common are our air handling units, okay? Uh, and these might be you know, up on our roof, a rooftop unit, okay? And that's typically these guys over here to the right, and we'll, we'll step into that on another slide here in a second. Uh, another one is our makeup air units. So if you're exhausting a lot of air, say you're maybe have a heat treat process in your facility uh, where you're burning and exhausting a lot of air, you, you need to make that air up in one way or another and, and temper it before you shove it into the space. And so that's our, our makeup air units. They're just trying to replace some of the exhausted air. Uh, beyond that, then we get into our, our circulation fans, uh, which take many different forms. We have exhaust fans, unit heaters, and then boilers, which are either creating our, our steam or hot water to heat our facility. So we're gonna step into each one of these just a little bit here in a bit. Uh, so one, one of the, I think most common, because it pulls everything together, are these air handling units. So here's a, here's a diagram of a really basic air handling units. You probably have several of them over your head right now, up on, up on the roof working. Uh, and, and really what it's doing, it's taking both return air as well as outdoor air. It brings it in, it's gonna filter it first or reheat it, and then I should say it's gonna filter and then it's gonna reheat it and then it brings it through, and then there's uh, standard to most pieces of equipment, there's a cooling coil and then a reheat coil uh, before it gets pushed out into our space, okay? Uh, there's different variations of this, say for a commercial building, but this is the general concept that you'll likely see. And so our cooling coil, this is where we're maybe taking our chilled water and dumping it in, whereas that reheat coil, that could be our steam, that could be a, a hot water heater that's dumping uh, water in there for us, okay? So that's a, stand, that's a standard approach. Okay, so similar to lighting and, and similar to, uh, you know, what we were talking about last week, there are some basic terms in this area as well. The, the most common when it comes to most of this comfort, uh, uh, comfort creature comfort equipment, uh, the most common ling lingo is this ton of cooling, which really it, it's pretty straightforward in that it's the, the rate of energy that results from freezing a ton of ice okay and so it, it could be freezing or melting it's the same amount of energy it's just whether it's going into or coming out of uh, that water slash ice okay so that is one ton of cooling uh, if we look at it from a slightly different lens one ton of cooling equals 12,000 BTU per hour, okay? So that's one of these conversion factors that we might wanna use. Uh, another way that you might convert it is over to kilowatt out or kilowatts. That is not quite as common, uh, I can tell you, but you might wanna know that. Uh, but this tonnage is really the, the way that you'd buy most of your equipment, okay? So you would determine the amount of cooling you might need in a space, amount the amount of heat that you might need to remove from the area and then you work backwards to figure out that that cooling load uh, so for for a house you know it might be for a lot of houses that are built you might be in the three ton range to just kind of give you an, an, an order of magnitude there whereas for a for a facility for an industrial facility you can be talking uh, orders a magnitude more than that three 300 tons, 500 tons, 1,000 tons, 3,000 tons, uh, depending on what you're doing and, and what's going on in your facility, okay? This is all based on, uh, the chillers systems really are all based on this basic vapor compression cycle, okay? And uh, so here's a diagram of, of the most simple version where on one side, we have what we call our evapor evaporator, which if, if you're gonna think about this, it's evaporating this liquid, this blue liquid that's traveling through that line. That liquid is refrigerant, okay? So this is taking heat, putting it into that, uh, that liquid where it then boils and turns into a gas, okay? And from, from there, we use a compressor and a lot of times, uh, you know, 
this is our this is really the chiller. This is what's making all that noise for the most part, uh, and it converts it from a low pressure, low temperature vapor into a high pressure, high temperature vapor that will typically get sent outside. Okay, sometimes it gets sent to let's say a cooling tower, or sometimes it's sent to uh, 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 just a heat exchanger, you know, if it's an air cooled heat exchanger and it dumps the heat outside and that's in our condenser. So it's condensing that vapor back down into a liquid. And then there's this last component here, this expansion valve where we then take that uh, and, and convert it into a low pressure uh, liquid and we just repeat the cycle, okay? So this is the basics of how we cool our facility, okay? The beauty of this though is that it just depends on whether you want to cool or heat. It's the same theory that's used for heat pumps, okay? You just reverse where we're putting the heat and where we're taking the heat from, okay? So for a heat pump, you're just taking, uh, this might be outside, and this is being pumped inside of your facility, okay? Same basic theory uh, with all of it, okay? So when we're looking at chillers, when we're looking at pieces of equipment, you know, the, some of you can do the calculations and understand that full cycle that I just showed, but most of us need something really simple. You know, they need a, the speedometer to tell them how fast they're going, right? And so in the world of air conditioning, uh, this has been done. The, this, this metric, this speedometer has been developed for us. It's this EER and the SEER. So EER is our energy efficiency rating, whereas the S is just a seasonal energy efficiency rating. And, and they use these numbers to uh, compare different pieces of equipment, okay? So that way you can understand whether or not you have a fairly efficient unit or a not so efficient unit. Uh, the most standard way for kind of smaller pieces of equipment uh, are really based on this Energy Star guide. Uh, and most of you have likely seen this in, in one form or fashion, uh, these energy guides, will be posted on a piece of equipment. They'll typically have a range as to, uh, you know, what's typically on the market at that point and what that specific piece of equipment is rated at. Uh, for for most, um, I would say for for the EER, this energy efficiency rating, the most efficient or the, the average uh, of, of those in the top rung of efficiency is right below 14. So if you have a piece of equipment with a 14 EER, that's pretty good. Whereas this SEER, the seasonal energy efficiency rating, it's a touch over 19, okay? So we can, we can see down here, the two that I pulled here, there's a 17, that's okay. It could be a little bit better, right? Uh, whereas on the left-hand side, it's only a 10. So this is much worse, okay? So these, these are a little bit of that speedometer to help us understand things. But if you wanna go a little bit deeper and start to understand what's going on. I have thrown a couple equations out here for you, <laughs> okay? So the EER, it's, it's fairly simplistic. It's just that BTU of cooling versus the electrical input in terms of watts, okay? So that's this EER. It's, uh, it's not a unitless number. It, it's BTU per watt hour, okay? But uh, that's the basis of this. If we make it a unitless number, then we get to the COP. The COP is the coefficient of performance. And that's another really common uh, metric for us to use, okay? And that's really simply the useful output. So the useful cooling output versus that required electrical input, okay? These are, these are just terms to help us be conversant in that space, okay? Uh, you can see if we go one step further, all of a sudden, oh, that COP is directly related to the EER. This is the equation that essentially turns the EER into a unitless number, that 3.412, okay? Uh, and so if we take this another step further, one of, the, one of the common things that we will see really chillers uh, being rated as this kilowatt per tonnage. So it's just a kilowatt of electrical input over that uh, ton of cooling output. So it's just another, it's just another variation, okay? Uh, it's not super complex, but this is how you can take maybe a cut sheet or a spec sheet from a manufacturer and then just convert it around so you compare it 
to other pieces of equipment. Okay, and then the last one is this SEER, uh, which is it's it's a seasonal average. Uh, it's a little bit more com complicated, uh, so I'm not going to go into that right now. But uh, just know that it's really it's more of an average of the energy efficiency rating for the season. Okay. All right, that was on the air conditioning side, the chiller side. Okay, on the heat pump side, it's more or less the same concept. It's, things are just flipped a little bit. So instead of the SEER, there's this SPFF, S, S, H, S, P, F. There we go. And one of these days I'll get it out. The, the, it's, a, it's just a, it's a metric for evaluating heat pumps, the heating seasonal performance factor. There we go. Uh, and that's in terms of this BTU, again, per watt hour. So that looks pretty familiar, right, to that, that EER rating. It's a, it's a, it's a unit number BTU per watt hour whereas we can take that a step further and then we're back in the COP coefficient of performance again with a nice little conversion factor of the two so this these are these are the the approaches that just help us to speak the right language and understand that speedometer of how fast or slow we're going here okay on the heat pump side uh, I showed you some of the the EER and the SEER uh, some of energy stars better uh, piece of equipment there for heat pumps it's it's right around 11 is uh, what we're looking at here so if we're looking up at this piece of equipment he's not looking so good okay so we can be doing a lot better there okay so those are the basics on our, our on our equipment now let's step into the opportunities uh, the one of the big ones is this set point reset uh, for our facility so uh, essentially what this means is you know, when the space is unoccupied, we don't want to cool or heat it to to the level that we would when people are there. Okay, so say during the summertime, if you're cooling uh, your space down to let's say 70 degrees when everyone's working and and doing their stuff, you know, at nighttime when everyone leaves, it does us no good to continue to chill that space down. So we can reset it temporarily to go back up to let it float up to 80 degrees and then maybe cool it down or pre-cool it a little bit before everyone gets back into work in the morning. Do the same thing during the winter time frame, uh, where we just let it drift down and then we re would reheat it before people come back in. So that's a really basic one uh, in, our, in our home environment. Uh, that's what uh, a lot of those smart thermostats, that's, that's essentially the basis of those it's just controlling it to only heat or only cool when needed okay so a couple other things here to avoid uh, similar to the lighting we don't want to over light or under light a space uh, similarly on the air handling side or, or the the comfort aspect of things we don't want to overheat we don't want to overcool we don't want to over dehumidify so take too much humidification out of the air and we don't want to overventilate, okay? So we don't want to have too many air changes per hour in here, okay? So sticking with this air handling units, a couple standard opportunities. Uh, one of them, which is really true for, for most fluid moving systems, whether that's pumps or fans, uh, are VFDs. So being able, to, being able to have the ability to just change the speed of the fan versus let's say using a damper to uh, either either choke down on the airflow coming in or choke down on the airflow coming out of the fan, okay? Another opportunity is this uh, fan pressure set point reset, okay? Uh, and this is really important if you have an air handler that's maybe serving a lot of different offices, right? And in those offices, people are uh, either cranking down on the, the, the box, uh, you know, maybe they have uh, a, a locally controlled unit uh, uh, that's controlling the airflow into that uh, office. If you get a whole bunch of them closed, then it gives us an opportunity to then reset the, the main distribution pressure going out into the space, okay? So a really basic opportunity here is this filter maintenance. Uh, similar to your home you should replace it from time to time uh, because what we're doing is ultimately starving 
our our fan okay another opportunity specifically with these air handling units to look at is this reheat valve leakage uh, one of the biggest issues typically with air handling units is the fact that you are simultaneously heating and cooling so you're you're trying to take energy out of the airstream and then you're trying to put energy back into the airstream uh, by and large it's, it's done to help control the the uh, humidity and, and that's why we're doing this kind of dual thing the problem is that if something gets stuck either either mechanically or even in the control system it can be a little bit of a runaway issue okay uh, where you're starting to cool more so you need to reheat more and then you are reheating a little bit too much so you need to cool more right and that you just see this gradual escalation and a more you know simplified approach the way that some of these things work that maybe relates to your to your home life is that when you're driving home it'd be like using your gas pedal as well as the brake pedal at the same time to try to keep going further and further uh, at some point in there you want to be able to back off uh, and so uh, one of the mechanical issues is in that reheat valve leakage so it just lets things going it, it lets some of that hot water or, or steam constantly go through which then for the most part, we're always having to take out. So checking the mechanicals of it, but I would also put on here, uh, checking the controls of some of these units to make sure that you're not always doing both things uh, full blast all the time. And then the last item, and this is uh, obviously a bit more in the CapEx area, uh, it's just more efficient equipment. So uh, higher energy efficiency ratings or that seasonal energy efficiency rating. You know, if we're gonna buy new equipment, uh, do the do the quick back of the envelope to see whether or not it makes sense to go to the highest level of energy efficiency rating. Okay, uh, there's a lot of aspects uh, and, and things to consider when you have an opportunity to purchase new equipment. Uh, but the fact is, most of our equipment sticks around for a really long time. So if we install the right thing up front, it can make a big impact. And so on that front, here are two more items to consider when you are maybe putting in a new system or revamping a full system. Uh, air economizers and then these energy recovery wheels. Air economizers are actually fairly common, though a lot of times people seem to bypass them. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe they have an issue with one of the motor actuators in there and then next thing you know, it's completely broke or bypassed and uh, defeats the purpose. These economizers, essentially what, what they're doing uh, in, this, in this little graphic here, if you can follow me here, there are two little dampers on here that are actuated. There's an outside air uh, that's being pulled in, okay, or that can be pulled in. And then there's this return air that comes back. Well, depending on the season, you know, it might be more beneficial to just take pure outside air and bring that in and then exhaust all of our return air, you know, outside. Or there might be seasons where it's better to try to recirculate as much of the air from our facility and try to recirculate it as much as possible to make sure that we keep the energy within our facility, whether you know we were taking that out or heating it up. Um, and so there are different strategies there. And there these air economizers can have a really massive impact, especially for parts of the country with uh, some of these big seasonal swings. You know, if you uh, are in Ohio, you know, you might have a really comfortable day and a really chilly night. And so th these things will want to change throughout the day. You know, that strategy of, do we want to use more outside air? Do we want to use uh, more of the indoor air and keep recirculating it? It has a major impact. Another way of approaching this though, are these energy recovery wheels. Okay. Sometimes these things can be called like an enthalpy wheel. Um, essentially what it is, for the most part is a, a two-way wheel where air might be going past in one direction and maybe that's being exhausted. And then on the top side is coming in and this wheel right here will slowly rotate around. And so in this case, you, you gotta use your imagination a little bit because they have this, uh, they have this wheel pulled out. So it typically I don't think will be uh, uh, shoved in in that, that manner there. But what will happen is the exhaust air going out, whether that's warmer or cooler, 
that'll heat up this wheel. Typically that wheel is either made of ceramic, it might be made of metal, uh, but it will heat it up to whatever that indoor temperature is. And then as it rotates, the outside air that's being pulled into the facility will get essentially pre-tempered a bit. So some of the energy will get transferred from that outgoing stream to the ingoing stream, okay? So if it's really cold, say if it's a winter time frame, you know, the, the air being exhausted from your facility might be really warm, you know, it might be 70 degrees, right? And if it's winter time, who knows? Maybe that's 32 degree air, okay? Well, wouldn't it be nice to take a little bit of energy from that 70 degree stream, put it into the 32 degree stream that way? We can just reuse some of the energy that we already had to use earlier to bring the air up to 70 degrees. Okay, so that's, that's these energy recovery wheels. Couple more opportunities specific to some of the, the various pieces of equipment, okay? So one of them are these exhaust fans. Uh, you'll typically see these kind of all over the place. They might be up in the ceiling. A lot of times they're on the wall, uh, but they're these really simple uh, fan that might have a little louver on the outside of it. Uh, but the big thing with a lot of these is not to run them 24-7. Um, a lot of them have very dumb controls or no controls at all, and they're just run uh, literally 24-7 and constantly dumping air uh, or bringing air out of your facility when that's not always needed. There are definitely cases where you need to exhaust air. Uh, from an energy standpoint, from a health standpoint, there are cases when you want to do that, but then there's some times where we just don't need that at all. And so the opportunity to turn this off or to control them based on a number of um, strategies is really important. Installing VFDs, not so much on, on these little guys like this, but if you have a kind of a much larger exhaust plenum or, or fan in your system, there might be opportunities there to install a VFD. Uh, to then ramp it up, ramp it down, uh, to then just uh, meet the need of what's required in the space. With these small guys like this that you might see on, on your wall, one common opportunity is these notched V-belts, which there's a little belt, you can just barely see it back here, but there's our motor down here, and then it's turning this sprocket up here. Well, there's typically a belt that goes between those two. A slightly more efficient approach and something that you should probably look at just stocking in your uh, uh, maintenance uh, closet regardless is a notched v-belt which uh, as the name implies is just a little belt that has notches in it instead of being completely smooth it has these notches which allow it to bend easier and so that's where the efficiency gain is that it allows the belt to bend and uh, not only does it save a a little bit of energy, a couple percentage, you know, maybe three to five percent, but it also can make that belt last much, much longer. Uh, so there's some maintenance savings for sure on that stuff. Uh, and then this last point here, this over exhausting, uh, really relates back to, you know, only delivering what you need. So don't let it run 24-7, uh, have the right controls, you know, understand why you're trying to exhaust, okay? Another item, which are typically super popular in a lot of facilities are these circulating fans, okay? Uh, they can be anything from the, the version I'm showing here on the right, uh, or they can be just the little stand-up fans that you might have at a, a little production cell. And you're delivering, uh, you know, some cooling for a person that's working. You know, that's, that's fine and well if there are people there, but what happens at lunch or what happens when uh, people go home the shift ends for the whole day we want to be able to turn those off or at least instill the behavior to turn these things off when they're not needed uh, more advanced approaches are are based on temperature and humidity uh, these ceiling fans can you know typically be reversed so in the winter time they can be pushing hot air to the ground in the summertime uh, you reverse it so you're pushing uh, air directly down onto the people to provide that cooling uh, so recirculation, the circulation fans, the much bigger ones, you might be able to do VFDs, the smaller ones, uh, not so much, but it's the same deal where you just want to avoid uh, over circulating, doing too much uh, if, if you don't know why. All right, so another one of these, and we're getting closer to the end here uh, for, for this section anyways, are unit heaters, 
Okay, so unit heaters, the most common ones that we'll typically see look something like this guy down here in the bottom left. Uh, maybe it's driven by steam, maybe it's driven by hot water, you know, where it's pumped in there uh, for heating purposes. And uh, there's typically a little fan in there that will pull air through and it heats the air up. And for most, most of the time, it'll push the air down just a little bit before that air goes back up. So that's one really common version. Uh, a second one are these infrared heaters, okay? Uh, here's a, a really simple example where there's uh, typically either a ceramic element in there or it could be uh, natural gas fired, but it heats a tube in there and then that tube gets glowing hot and then radiates the heat away from it. So, so this is a really simple version. In the picture up here, there's a couple, there's a couple pictures. If you can see my little drawing here, those are infrared heaters that are really high up off the ground. And they're these big U-shaped uh, uh, devices where it's blowing the, there's a little burner on one side and it blows the, the flame down and around and it heats that tube up in there to, to get, you know, smoke and hot, like red hot. And then it radiates and it pushes all the heat all the way to the ground, okay? And so it's using radiation instead of convection to push the heat down. And so there's some really good things here. With all of these, with all of these uh, systems, again, we want to try to avoid that manual, you know, just let it run 24-7 and try to have some slightly more intelligent control with that. So turning it off when not needed, that could be, uh, for the most part, accomplished with just uh, basic temperature controls. Uh, we want to avoid overheating. And then more and more, especially for manufacturing facilities, uh, looking at these infrared heaters, whether it's for spot heating to heat someone out of process, or whether it's if you have a facility that looks a lot like this one, where there's really high ceilings, right? We want to be able to push the heat to the people that are on the floor and not just heat the the ceiling, okay? And so that's one of the one of the issues typically with the traditional unit heaters in that we warm the air up and as most of us know warm air rises so for a lot of our facilities all that warm air is going to go right up and if you have somebody down on the floor they're not going to kind of reap the benefits of a slightly warmer facility so that's where infrared heaters are uh, kind of a big win okay so this is a case where it's a really good application of these infrared heaters because it's so high uh, of a ceiling that they're pushing the heat all the way to the ground, the ground and the people then warm up a little bit uh, before that heat then ends up rising. Uh, these things are also really popular and really uh, well suited for dock doors. Uh, so if you're loading and unloading, uh, instead of you know opening the dock door and having a whole bunch of air just gust right through and taking all the hot air with it, uh, these these infrared units help push the the heat to the people that are working there. Okay. All right. So now we're uh, going to be shifting gears a little bit. We were talking lighting, and then we talked some of the equipment, uh, HVAC wise. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the the building envelope before we wrap up here. Okay. So building envelope really just consists of all of the different parts of the building everything from our walls to our roofs to our windows, uh, exterior doors. Uh, it also includes some of the internal uh, structures as well. So if you have a, a large manufacturing space uh, or you have a warehouse, you know, maybe you have a small office set inside of that warehouse and you, know, you don't need to necessarily do everything, right? You don't need to uh, uh, heat or cool the entire warehouse. You just want to do the office where people are sitting most of the day or working, okay? So uh, this building envelope does take a number of different forms and fashions. A couple things to note here is that building envelopes for manufacturing are really, in some cases, very different, in some cases, a little bit different than commercial buildings. Uh, some, of the, some of the biggest differences that we typically see are that manufacturing facilities uh, in some cases don't require heat. Um, I've, for better or worse, I've, I've been in uh, a number of facilities 
in northern Ohio in the middle of winter, and there's you know not, not a lick of heat at all. <laughs> You're just really bundled up, and uh, so that is a that's a that's one big aspect uh, to keep in mind. Another is that not all facilities are cooled. If it's not heated you're darn certain it's probably not cooled. Um, more often than not, we do see facilities that have some minimum level of heating, uh, maybe no cooling. So maybe if you're far enough north, you know, that might be your facility. Though, though that is changing a lot. We, uh, we are seeing many facilities that are moving towards trying to provide, uh, you know, comfort cooling, again, to cut at that, you know, productivity aspect of things. So uh, that is different. And then one thing that typically will be a lot different in our building envelope for, for manufacturing is just the, the pure ventilation rates uh, to, to move air around, to move heat, uh, cooling. Uh, one thing that we'll typically see in manufacturers that we won't see in a commercial building is maybe a, a big heat treat furnace right in the middle of your uh, facility, right? Well, that heat treat furnace is sucking in a lot of air. Uh, you know, it's combusting it. It's it's heating our parts. It's heat treating, right? And then all of that exhaust goes up and out. Well, all that air that gets sucked in for that combustion, it needs to be replaced somewhere else. And so, uh, you know, you might you might notice at a manufacturing site that there's a lot of air being pulled in, maybe at the dock doors, or you might have a door that, uh, you know, won't quite close. Uh, or it closes, you know, with a big slam, right? And you may not see that if you if you go to a couple other, uh, you know, maybe a hotel or somewhere else. Uh, so these are a couple of the big items, I guess, to just keep in mind that manufacturing is a little bit different on this building envelope front. But with that said, there still are uh, some some overlaps in terms of the the pieces of material, the the building construction, things like that that are ubiquitous, whether it's commercial, industrial, or even residential. The big one is our insulation, okay? So insulation, when we typically talk insulation, uh, the, the lingo that we're using is this R value. It's just the resistance to heat, okay? So the higher the R value, the, the more the thermal resistance. So essentially the better it is at keeping heat in or keeping it uh, where we want it. Okay, so the, the picture up here, this guy is just doing a, a fiberglass bat insulation. Uh, this is obviously a little bit more of a residential picture here, but uh, it's, this, it's the same general theory here. Um, these, the R value of, of all this insulation, uh, for the most part, it's determined by the thickness and the type of material that we're using, okay? So a lot of times when we're talking R value, uh, the thicker you make a material, the higher the R value goes. The the better the material you maybe put in, the the you know the better the R value gets. So, uh, as an example here, uh, you know a one inch of a solid wood, you know so maybe this is uh, relating to our our picture here, you know that has an R value of one. Whereas if we look at a blown cellulose, so this this is typically what you might see in your house, okay. Uh, the R value of the blown cellulose might be somewhere in that three to four range, okay? So quite a bit better. And this is typically in a per inch. So an R value is typically a per inch uh, type of rating. And then we just figure out, you know, what, what thickness of insulation we have. And then that gives us our total R rating. Uh, this this uh, example here in the bottom right-hand quarter is uh, a little bit more relevant for our industrial facilities where you this is more the the roofing installation for a lot of our manufacturing sites where there's a metal deck and then there's uh, maybe some insulation in between uh, that might be a, a hard uh, insulation board perhaps uh, finally finished off with a um, metal roofing uh, on the top in some clay in some cases you might even put some dirt and some plants and some other things and you call it a green roof right? Uh, that is seeming to take effect in some cities uh, more and more, but th these are all just different approaches um, and it provides some different benefits. For all of our insulation, regardless if it's our walls, our ceiling, uh, one 
really good activity to keep in mind is to do an installation assessment from time to time. And uh, for the most part, there's a lot of equipment that's out there that you can use. Here's an example. This is just an infrared camera. Uh, if you're a better plants partner, uh, we have several of them. We have some really fancy ones here that we'll loan out uh, for free. Uh, we'll, we'll give them to you, just don't break them, right? And what these things, these things are great at doing a lot of different things. One, obviously you can check insulation levels. You can see uh, where you're either losing heat or, or heat is coming through, but it also gives us some uh, better ways of seeing maybe some of the construction defects that may have happened. Uh, so here's a couple of different examples over on the right hand side of, uh, you know, it gives you that x-ray vision into a wall. Uh, in some cases, it can let you see, you know, maybe where water leakage is coming into a wall. Uh, these things, and I think we'll probably touch on it in a, in a future uh, session here, you know, these infra red cameras can be used for uh, pieces of equipment. Okay, so checking the insulation, say in a furnace or our steam system, but they can also be used on our electrical systems too. So to, to identify uh, bad connections in our switch gear. So uh, some really good stuff there, uh, really important piece of uh, equipment. So that's kind of a roofs and, and um, uh, walls. Next big one is in our windows, okay? So windows, uh, there's a couple main uh, types of uh, lingo that we use here. The big one for windows, it's not an R rating like we do for insulation, it's a U factor, okay? And the two are essentially just the inverse of one another, okay? Uh, just purely the inverse of one another. The, the second item on here is this HSGC, it's a solar heat gain coefficient. Uh, and essentially what that is, is the, the lower the number is, the less heat that we're picking up from the sunlight coming in, okay? Uh, and so that's, a, that's an important factor if we have, let's say, eastern and western facing windows, or maybe if we have southern facing windows with zero shading at all during the summer, uh, it just means that there will be a much more heat coming into our facility. Uh, and then the, these next two, this visible transmittance, you know, the amount of light that comes in and then the air leakage, it's just uh, literally the, the amount of air seepage through the window frame construction. So here is uh, an example of some of these typical window ratings and how you might see them if you're, if you're ever gonna buy them, okay? Uh, and what we're looking at here, there's the frame types in this first column. We have a, a glazing type, essentially the number of uh, panes, window panes in here. You can see there's single, there's this double, uh, even a triple in here, okay? And then over here on the right-hand side is the, the rating criteria. Uh, we have clear glass, and then there's just tinted glass, okay? So the U factor for these guys, uh, this is like that R rating. This is this is the heat conductance through our window. Uh, you can see what some of the numbers are. The the general trend, if you look down through there, the single glass, it's worse than our triple pane glass. Okay, so uh, the lower the number, the better. The solar heat gain coefficient. This is again for our clear glass. If you if you contrast that with the tinted glass over here. That's where these numbers are a little bit different. So let's say a double pane glass might be 0.59, whereas that tinted glass, because it's not letting in all the sun rays, uh, it's not bringing in all the heat as well. So the solar heat gain coefficient is a little bit less, okay? And then that last one is VLT. This is the visible light transmittance. So how much light is actually coming through and coming into our facility. Similar to that solar heat gain coefficient, same uh, general, things are going on here where uh, the clear glass is a bit higher than the tinted glass, okay? So uh, really putting some of this stuff together, uh, ASHRAE has uh, some building requirements uh, for all different types of buildings. We talked about ASHRAE a little bit during last week's session. So ASHRAE 90.1 really provides the standards, the framework, uh, kind of the base minimum of what is considered good practice. And so they have 
really all of this information listed out by building type as well as by climate zone. Okay, so depending on where you live or where your facility might be located, you're going to want to build it in slightly different ways to, to really maximize the efficiency of it. And so ASHRAE is, is really a, a great reference point. Uh, you can see in here, you know, they have things uh, specified for, let's say, roofs and what the, the, the minimum R value should be. Uh, and they have it for non-residential. Non in this case, I'm showing non-residential. There's this residential and then the, the, the semi-heated uh, facilities. But then they go through all the different uh, building construction components. So there's roofs, there's walls, there's doors, uh, there's glazing. So this glazing, that's our windows. Uh, and so they have all of this stuff located in here, okay? So it's a nice one-stop shop. If you are really doing some new construction, this is kind of that threshold. Hey, this is what I want it to be built to at a minimum. You might want to do a little bit more. And, and the way a lot of that is based is really on these climate zones. And so right now, the, the U.S. has seven climate zones. Uh, there are more in this world, depending on if you are higher or lower, but uh, you know these climate zones essentially help us dictate what type of uh, building construction you might want to consider because each one of these zones will receive a very or, or experience a very similar climate, okay? Uh, so for some of you, you might be up here in Ohio, you're in uh, climate five, right? Uh, whereas in, in the construction there, would be radically different than, let's say, if you're building maybe out in Los Angeles or down in Miami, Florida, okay? The, the construction techniques that you wanna use or follow are gonna be significantly different because there's just a, a wildly different climate uh, zone difference with those and, and what they experience. So a couple things to really keep in mind here uh, when it comes to building envelope so the big one is really our exterior walls and our roofs and building those correctly in, in, in such a way that we make them pretty tight uh, tight and insulated so uh, in the case of this guy on the right he's spraying on this foam I've seen this in a number of uh, manufacturing facilities not necessarily spraying onto what looks like uh, you know plywood and, and uh, two by sixes there but onto metal framework, you know, you spray this and not only can it provide uh, pretty good insulation, you know, from, from stopping thermal conductance through the building, but it also provides an air tightness. It provides a barrier, a solid barrier, so that air doesn't come in and out of our facilities. You know, we want, we want to only uh, have the, the right amount of air, similar to many of the items we were talking in throughout the, the presentation. We just want the right amount of air. So we, Want to know the purpose of that and typically we don't want a hole in the side of our wall we don't want a hole in the side of our house <laughs> right uh, same thing with our building envelope so with our exterior walls and our roofs uh, you know more insulation uh, the better insulation the better air tightness we can get uh, obviously the better uh, for our walls kind of a standard might be an r13 with uh, this 7.5 continuous insulation so uh, where we don't have it broken up uh, across, uh, you know, say the different trusts there or, or uh, support beams. On our roofs, one thing you might want to consider, depending on where you're at, is our is a cool roof, where uh, a lot of times, uh, more and more, we're, you'll see that uh, they put down kind of a white rubber roof, and that white reflects the sunlight. And so instead of uh, you know, the sun coming up in the middle of the day in the middle of July and heating your roof up to crazy temperatures, it reflects a lot of that light out and doesn't let that seep into your facility. Uh, so there are some opportunities for cool roofs. Uh, you can see there's a little bit higher level of insulation that's called for, a continuous insulation. Uh, but beyond that, there's also these other opportunities in other system areas. So windows having uh, a window film or shading, especially if you have uh, eastern, western, or southern exposures of your facility, uh, having, having shading approaches. And that could be something such as a, a fenestration. It could be 
uh, blinds. It could be just having trees planted out in front of those. Uh, if it's kind of an aesthetic thing, there are window films that can help with the solar heat gain and really reduce that. Okay, so that's a that is a big thing uh, for for the installation purposes. Getting a double pane or a double layered window or higher uh, is typically the most efficient aspect. And then getting into these last two, uh, really these exterior doors and even interior doors. Uh, ultimately, we want to try to reduce the amount of airflow through these guys when it's not needed. And uh, one of the one of the really common opportunities here are these high speed rolling doors. So that's this picture over here on the right hand side. You know, as you get close to it, that thing zips up and you know, in the course of like a half a second, right? And then as soon as you might drive a forklift through it, the thing comes back down, okay? And so the, the purpose really of all of our doors and even on the interior side, we want to just try as much as possible to uh, separate unconditioned from conditioned spaces. So, uh, you know, if your whole building's conditioned, you know, we want, we want solid doors. We want quick acting doors, uh, you know, protecting your inside from your outside. But even on the inside, if you have areas uh, of your facility that need to be heated and cooled, whereas there might be uh, storage facilities that don't need to be heated or cooled at all, we want some type of physical separation of those two. And it makes a, it does make a, so similar to last week, this is not uh, painful homework, but uh, these are, these are simple things that hopefully all of you can do uh, after today's session. Okay. So number one, uh, what I want you to do is try to list the types of lights used in your facility. Okay. So that's going back to when we're talking about incandescent, uh, metal halides, maybe you have the fluorescence, uh, maybe you have LEDs, right? So what types of lights are you using in your facility? And the bonus on that one really is identifying the number of each one of those types or, or a roundabout, give it the old college try, okay? You don't, you don't need, all need to be professors, just give it the old college try to see, you know, roundabout, are we talking five metal halides? Are we talking 500 metal halides, okay? Um, the second one, this one's super simple, you should know it right away, is your space conditioned, yes or no? Okay, you can whether you've been complaining because it is or is not, <laughs> you know, a little too much, not enough. You should know this one. So the the tougher part of this question is what are the two types of equipment that are used? What are the two, you know, most prominent, the largest? Is it a chiller system? Is it an air handling unit system? Is it uh, is it just a, a little space heater? List those out. And then the third thing here, are there any opportunities or are there any openings in the building envelope or opportunities for quick doors? Okay. You have dock doors that are wide open all the time. Do you have uh, maybe other openings or holes that are just kind of always on? Maybe you have exhaust fans that are going all the time. I don't know. I don't know. Think about that one. If, if there is an opportunity, take a picture of it. Okay. So those are your three homework activities for this week. All right, and so if there are questions, I mentioned this at the very beginning, uh, there is a, a chat functionality uh, in the in the GoToWebinar software. And uh, I, I did see that some folks have sent in a, a couple of questions as we were stepping through things, but, uh, you know, do, uh, try to you know type them in if you can think of any uh, additional questions uh, alternatively you can try to virtually raise your hand here in the software and, and we can try unmuting you and hopefully that's not the most catastrophic uh, thing ever um, but with that uh, I think I will step through just a couple of the questions and uh, Marissa if if you can um, you know, you can feel free to read off any that, that I may miss in here um, that are coming in. Uh, but a, a couple of things, though. Um, so I, where do I start here? <laughs> so um, actually, before I even jump into the questions, I, I do want to throw out one, one, maybe two items here, especially as it relates to the 
just the general pandemic, the the COVID craziness that is going on, and and some things that I didn't mention, but uh, you know, one is is just an anecdote from one of our better building or better plants uh, partners, and it's on a technology related to our HVAC system that I I did not mention today, but uh, I, I think for for all of us it could be applicable. So within HVAC systems, one technology that you might really want to think about in today's world, especially with uh, you know maybe sending people home to work, are our uh, demand ventilation um, sensors. So so really sensors to monitor our CO2 levels, typically within office or commercial settings that would allow the system to ramp down. And uh, I will say the, the anecdote, uh, because I, I was just talking to one of our partners here last week, is Raytheon. Raytheon, uh, they were just looking at the data. They, they implemented the, the CO2 demand sensors uh, at one of their facilities uh, over the past year, and they were looking at their data just recently and wondering, wow, why, why is my one facility staggeringly better than some of my other facilities when you know more or less everyone everyone is being sent home and in large part the the big aspect of that is because as we are sending more people to work uh, from a telework type of a scenario those co2 demand sensors that are controlling our hvac supply air it allows the system to back down if you don't have as many people in the office space you know, similar to turning off your lighting, it allows your HVAC system to ramp down. So that's one thing. A second item, and this actually does relate to one of the questions uh, we, we did get uh, in here, is asking about using UV in our HVAC systems to help with the, the COVID situation and, and maybe disinfecting. Um, so there, there, I think there's a longer uh, maybe explanation here uh, of sorts, but the within HVAC, UV can be used within some of those, but I would really caution with this with the COVID uh, specifically, there, there are still studies coming out showing or investigating the potential for using UV to kill COVID, uh, the COVID virus. And I think the latest one that I saw was, uh, it does, it can kill COVID. However, in the studies, they had to use the most extreme highest level of UV in order to kill the virus. And so uh, I, by no means don't take my word as, as gospel here. Uh, it is something that you can look into uh, as an option, you know, putting a, a UV uh, uh, light in the HVAC unit uh, to, to help disinfect some of the air that's being recirculated in your facility, uh, but but caution you, the UV, and especially those UV lights that kill germs, it's a special type of UV, it's UVC, um, it's UVC, right? And it's extremely dangerous to humans. Um, it, it, it's not something that we are accustomed to, so it's, it's, it's not good stuff. So just be really careful. But alternatively, at least in, in the, today's times, I think one of the more prominent strategies is that uh, you use um, uh, dedicated outdoor air. So you use a lot of outdoor air uh, to really help flush the systems. So uh, if and where possible, if you have people coming back to work, really utilizing, you know, maybe 100% uh, outdoor makeup air uh, where and when possible. Okay. Um, so that is another maybe strategy that's not necessarily saving us the most energy, but, uh, certainly is, is much more important on the health of all of our workers. Uh, certainly as companies start to come back and, uh, reopen facilities, ramp facilities back up, trying to follow CDC requirements. Okay. So uh, those definitely are two uh, things here. So a couple other uh, items here, and I'm 
give me a second as I'm looking into uh, some of these lights or some of these uh, questions that are coming in. Um, so I think one of them, uh, Angel sent something in asking about uh, tracking energy consumption in our chillers. Is it is it feasible? Does it make sense to correlate our energy consumption for our chillers to the the cooling degree days? Uh, or should she be using the the building energy consumption? Uh, really, on that I would say. Yeah, if you can look at, uh, and I've seen this, just simple scatter plots, right, where you have the energy consumption of the chillers, maybe on the y-axis, and the cooling degree days uh, on the on the x-axis, or you know, as a proxy for cooling degree days, you maybe you use the average outdoor air temperature, okay, and those are those are that's a really simple, simplistic way of cutting at uh, those trends to see how much energy your chiller plant uses okay uh, so so really effective good way to go about doing that okay uh, let's see here another question asking about the ROI of, of uh, combining smart controls with LED lights in manufacturing settings uh, I, I mentioned uh, during the presentation right that LEDs are probably the technology you should be thinking about, right? I'm not a salesman, but uh, certainly that's the most effective technology of today. But the real beauty is when you combine uh, LEDs with these smart controls that uh, let you maybe set up zones, it lets you turn things on and off uh, uh, automatically. You know, so as people are coming in, it can help you turn things on uh, or, or turn them off. Uh, certainly, this is very popular uh, within office environments, and, and I think I even made a mention that you know some of these smart controls even let you essentially dim or or brighten the room with LEDs, so you can ramp it up. And uh, you know maybe you want to track maybe the the lighting levels of the sun to help with our our natural circadian rhythms, right? Um, and so there's a really big impact not only in switching the technology but adding those smart controls. I, I I think we even have a, a couple write-ups within our Better Buildings Solution Center where some partners have made the switch. Uh, one of them I think that maybe came to mind for me is in our, uh, I think it's Steelcase made a big retrofit and they had something on the order of like 60 to 70% savings by switching not only their lighting systems, but implementing these smart controls. Okay, so really big things. Uh, had another question, it looks like, come in from Kurt asking about the refrigeration tonnage in one of the conversion units that I had on one of those and whether, um, uh, I guess it's just a conversion unit. He was asking, is the value of 3.517 kilowatts dependent upon equipment performance? And uh, Kurt, if I, would, if I could pull up the slide here for you, I would, but the answer is it, it is not uh, dependent on equipment performance. The, it's just a... Um, it's just a way of, of talking, uh, or, or it's an equivalency, right, of, of one tonnage of cooling. One tonnage of cooling equals 12,000 BTUs, which equals 3.517 kilowatts. Okay, so so really, it's uh, uh, equipment performance agnostic. Okay, so a, a couple more uh, here, and uh, Marissa, I, I might need your help here because it, it looks like there's even more coming in. Um, maybe, maybe for the sake of time, we'll just go for a couple more. And for some of these, I, maybe I'll take them offline and I can try to get back to folks a little bit later. Um, okay. Hey, so, Tom. yeah. Hey, Chris, I, do you want me to help you with moderating by reading some off for you? Would that help? Oh, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, totally. So I'll just jump, um, right off of where you left off. And I think this one's from Dominic. The next one is Energy Star slash EER, only a United States based program. Yeah, so so Dominic, the Energy Star program is it's really a rating program that's specific to the US, but I can tell you that Energy Star, which is is run by our colleagues over at the Energy uh, Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, or the Environmental Protection Agency, <laughs> there we go. Um, they do have uh, sister programs around the world. So there are other uh, standards 
for most other countries around the world. So, so it is kind of regionally dependent. Uh, Energy Star and that Energy Star ratings that that I was showing in there uh, really is um, U.S. specific. But uh, with that said, the energy efficiency rating, right, or the seasonal energy efficiency rating, uh, really that can be applied around the world uh, because that it that's just a, a way that we can rate equipment and uh, it's not necessarily specific um, to the U.S. Okay, um, Marissa, are there, are there other other ones that? Yeah, um, let me see if I can pull up some other ones. How about, and just let me know if you don't want to answer any of these. Um, in a zone one, um, in parentheses, high temp slash high RH, should I use the supply air temperature to control the AHU, or should I control with the return air temperature? And this one is from Angel. Oh, okay. So um, so let me break this down for everyone just real quick. So so Angel, who's in zone one, so if, if we remember those ASHRAE climate zones, uh, so so probably down in maybe the Miami region, right? So high temperature, high relative humidity. Should she be using the supplier temperature to control the air handling unit? Or or what should what should be what should be should be uh, what should she be controlling uh, the unit on? So for that, Angel, the the I guess best case scenario for most of our our uh, facilities is to control on that return air temperature. Okay, so uh, that way we know what is ultimately being supplied in that room and, and what is being um, delivered to the occupants in that room. Okay, so typically the way a lot of these air handler air handling units are set to operate is that the um, the temperature of the air, that supply air, is is controlled by you know a, a chilled water valve that uh, is is somewhat separate from the the amount of air that's being delivered into the room. Okay, so the typically the fan, the supply air fan, will be controlled by that return air temperature, and then the supply air temperature will be controlled. And in most facilities, it's it's just trying to be held at a specific temperature you know maybe it's 55 degrees maybe it's a little bit lower than that for for you right uh and and so it's trying to typically just hold a supplier temperature and then uh, it allow the system allows that control valve to to actuate so that it can maintain that supplier temperature but ultimately the airflow and the load is then controlled by that return air temperature okay um, let's see a couple others here, Marissa. All right. Um, how about what is the current payback on typical energy reduction projects? Holy smokes. That is <laughs> really wide. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to dance and jive a little bit here because that is a, a really wide ranging question. So the, what's the typical current payback on energy reduction projects uh honestly it's all over the board i will maybe point you to two different things two different uh potential resources here uh so one uh is the department of energy's industrial assessment center program okay so the doe's iac program they provide low cost or they provide no cost energy assessments to small and mid-sized manufacturers okay and as part of that program they take all the recommendations that they've ever uh, given to a manufacturer and they put it into an open public database okay so this is fantastic and it's fantastic because it allows all the rest of us to go in and look and see you know what are what are the opportunities that have been found maybe in my specific sector right for my specific type of manufacturing facility and it the that database will tell you what the opportunity was as well as you know what the typical cost is what the typical savings has been what the implementation rate has been what that simple payback is and so you can really dive into some pretty deep things okay so that's one this industrial assessment center database and you just just google it it should pop up to the top of your list uh but it's it's a really uh, 
valuable resource for us out there. The second thing that I will mention is that uh, through the through our Better Plants program, we do our energy treasure hunts, right? Uh, you know, right now, you know, if you are able to get into a facility, right, if your facility is still operating, you know, maybe there's an opportunity where you can do a, a treasure hunt light. Maybe it's just you. I, I, I know uh, the folks at Nissan have taken the energy treasure hunt and I think they, they've made their own little kind of smaller condensed version where it's just a, a maybe a maintenance guy or two that walks through the facility and looks for for pieces of equipment that can potentially be shut off, right? Um, and, and so these treasure hunts that we run are really geared towards low cost, no cost opportunities. And by and large, when we have run these, the average identified savings is somewhere in the five to 10% of a utility or of a facility's footprint, right? So it's not small, small savings, five to 10% savings for low cost, no cost opportunities. Okay. So, um, that's that's another thing maybe to to keep in the back of your head and then uh for at least anecdotally right now the the typical implementation rate that we've seen on a lot of those is right around 50 percent so 50 percent of the opportunities identified during these treasure hunts gets implemented and so you know maybe that's somewhere in probably the the three to five percent savings range for our facilities okay so uh marissa are there others yeah, I think I found a good one to end on if you're cool with one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this one is, can we use your recording for our internal training or communication? So to play your recording to our energy team members. Oh, <laughs> that is a perfect one to end on. Oh, excellent. That, it's, send me your address. I'll send you the $5. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, everything that that at least I have ever presented, you know, that all the material that that we've come out with through the Better Plants program, uh, feel free to use it. It's it will all be available. I know the recordings for all of these are being placed up on the DOE's website. Okay, uh, if you, I think the slides are being place up there as well as a transcript of everything. So hopefully I didn't say anything too stupid through all this because it will be recorded for posterity. But uh, absolutely, if you want these recordings for your energy team, uh, 100%. Uh, I, I made this uh, note last week. I had a, a fantastic mentor long ago who, um, you know, one of his sayings was plagiarism saves time. And at least in the real world, in this energy world that we're living in, uh, I, I believe full heartedly in that. Feel free to steal anything that I put out, use it, uh, make it your own, uh, do as you see fit. Okay. So Marissa, I, with that, I think maybe we end on the Q and A and maybe do a quick preview uh, because next week we are going to be continuing this webinar series and we are going to have some friends over at the uh, USDA talking about their rural energy programs, as well as the Department of Commerce. Uh, we have some folks coming in talking about their manufacturing extension partnership programs. Uh, really some additional, just great resources that are out there that, that you might be able to plug into. So uh, please be sure to join us for that one. And then uh, after that, we have a, a couple more coming up, uh, at least for this initial, uh, the set of webinars, but as Eli mentioned at the very beginning, uh, please, 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 you know, send send some thoughts, send comments if you like these. If you want to hear some other topics, uh, send that stuff in. Uh, we're we're contemplating and debating, you know, how far out we extend this. Do we extend it? What do you what do you all want to hear about? What are you interested in? Um, and you know, see if we can pull on the right folks uh, or other companies to tell their story, right? So. With that, Eli, I, I don't know if you want to close it here uh, and, and say some parting words, but. I think you've said uh, everything I wanted to say, but I want to just continue to thank everyone for being part with us and please send feedback so we can continue to customize these uh, to your needs. All right, fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe.